Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Finally. Oh, no, no, not live. Alive. We, we, we survived. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to uh, the episode nine of Bearded Time. I am one of your hosts, Brad, the budding watch enthusiast. I'm joined uh, by my co-host, Mr. At Ready Set Watch on Instagram, uh, Ricardo. Bud, I feel like I haven't seen you in... Because you haven't. That's, that's how you feel like. So for those of you that don't know, um, I've been sick for like... I was like sick for like a week and a half. And so that... And I literally couldn't speak. Mm-mm. Literally couldn't talk. So not only did I feel like crap, but even if I wanted to do a podcast, I couldn't because I couldn't talk at all. Um, also got a new job, which has been fantastic so far. Um but the combination of kind of getting used to working eight to five, which I've never done in my entire life up to this point. Welcome uh, to the real world. Folks. Right. Welcome to, welcome to being an adult. <laughs> to, uh, combined with getting sick for a week and a half means that I am so far behind on producing content. We haven't been able to do this podcast in like a month. I haven't been able to put out any videos on budding watch enthusiasts for like three weeks. It took me like three weeks just to edit a six minute review for, for a watch for a watch of this that I had recorded a month ago, but just it just got oh it's been terrible. It's been awful. But we're back. <laughs> finally, finally. Yeah. Oh pal, it's it's good to see you. I, I, it's good to know that you're alive. I'm um, you, I'm happy to be alive. Believe you me. haven't caught any bugs, because Lord knows there's one going around that uh is just affecting everything. We're gonna talk about it later in the um, podcast yep um let's start with the wristwatch check though you're gonna go first because i have something new well actually we both have something new <laughs> so you know what you're gonna go first damn it but <laughs> mine, mine spills off into a topic so anyway yeah. um i was super excited when i uh discovered these a couple of weeks ago um i had no idea about them um and we're going to talk about it a little bit later in this episode because i'm really just tickled pink with this entire line that Swatch decided to put out. So for those of you that did not see, um, Swatch is doing a crossover with the 007 film franchise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. He recently delayed No Time to Die, which I just caught, punched me in the gut. <laughs> we, we will discuss that as oh, well. Oh, we will. Um, but anyway, so they released six Swatches commemorating some of the older Bond films. And then there's the Swatch uh, Q that's coming out, I think, later this week, actually, uh, in a tomorrow. couple of weeks. Tomorrow. Oh, it's tomorrow, sure. Um, okay. That's commemorating the new No Time to Die film, and that's going to actually be in the movie. Um, but, the, but the six that, were, that came out beforehand are just amazing. They're everything that you want a limited edition line to be. You know what? We're talking about it now, because I'm already, I'm already in the thick of it anyway. So we're just going to talk about it now. So they, they released six watches um, themed after Dr. No... On Her Majesty's Secret Service, Moonraker, License to Kill, World is Not Enough, and Casino Royale. Now, we, there's, there's no shortage of James Bond special edition watches that exist out in the world because God, God knows Omega does like two a year, Indeed. whether there's a Bond film coming out or not. And those watches are done with varying degrees of fan service. So, and, and sometimes none at all, really. I mean, like, like the new one that they put out that's going to be in the film, there's very little fan service going on there. The thing that I appreciate about the Swatch line that came out is that not only are these, like, super fan service they're, like, super deep cut. Like, you have to be, like, a Bond super fan to understand some of the references that these watches deliver right off the bat. Um, all six of them are pretty good. Some are better than others. And sold out. And they're all sold out, of course. Um, the one I really wanted was the On Her Majesty's Secret Service one. I ordered one, but they short-stocked it, and so they had to cancel the order. They refunded me for it, and there was no way to get it. Like, I could, I could pay twice the price for it on eBay right now if I wanted to, but I'm not, I'm not doing that. One I did end up with, and that's what I'm wearing today, is the Dr. No uh, wristwatch in the line there um again this is one of those ones when i first saw it as a huge fan of the movies um i knew what they were going for immediately because dr no the first james bond film 
is, has the weirdest title sequence of all of them because they hadn't quite figured out kind of like the James Bond title formula when the first one came out. So the title sequence is just these like flashing, colorful, like psychedelic, uh, like dots that just kind of populate all over the screen uh, set to the James Bond theme. And as you can see on the band of the watch, that's exactly what they're going for here with this one. In addition to the dial uh, has hour markers that are in the different colors as well. And each hour marker says no on it. So you have a bunch of no's going around uh, of the dial to commemorate uh, Dr. No. All of these lines are all of the watches in the line are pretty fantastic. Um, I know Giancarlo uh, got the Moonraker one, which is great. Um, if, you, if you look at the image on the Swatch website, what you may not realize is the Moonraker uh, shuttle on the watch is actually part of the minute hand. So as the minute hand goes around the watch, the Moonraker shuttle uh, goes around with it, which is pretty dope. Um, like the license to kill watch is kind of like sort of Miami themed because the, the movie, part of the movie takes place in Key West. The strap has like iguana print on it because the villain in the film has like a pet iguana that's prominent in the film. My wife got the Casino Royale one, which is designed very deliberately off of the title sequence for Casino Royale. This is what special edition lines should be. And the thing that made me super excited because of course with the Omega watches, I'm not going to own those. I don't have not, I don't have, I don't have regular Omega Speedmaster money, much less special edition James Bond Omega Seamaster money. I'm probably never going to own a single one of those watches, but all of these swatches that came out were like $105 a piece. Mm. That's like for that, for, for me, $105 is not a, a, an amount of money that I need to really think about spending on a watch. I can just kind of throw that out there and it is what it is. Now the Q watch is a little bit more expensive. Yep. I think that's over 200 if I'm not mistaken. Indeed. I that's was not, hoping it would be automatic, but it doesn't seem like it is. It's, it's, it's just, yeah, that's, that's, that's the more bizarre part too. Like it's one thing if you're going to charge that much and, and make it a mechanical watch, but it's, it's definitely a quartz because it has the quartz like actuator or oscillator, whatever the hell that part is that you can see because the dial is skeletonized. Yep. It comes out exactly at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Well, I'm probably not getting that one. Like I said, oh. ske skeletonized dials are not my thing anyway. That, that dial is fully skeletonized. Like, mm -hmm. like if you don't, don't want to see the innards of the watch, then don't buy the Q. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it'll be cool to see another Q watch that's not Timex that'll be sold out everywhere, I, I guess. Because I'd imagine that's probably going to go pretty quick as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the Q, um, but it's definitely one of those things where, you know how they always try to get you with the limited editions? Of course. They try to tell you last minute and then you jump on it and you don't have enough time to think whether you want it or not. Um, I've had enough time to think about the Q where I'm just like, I really like the box and how they're going to set it up with it, with it. But I don't think I'm willing to spend that much on it for... I think I think I'll, I'll just enjoy it from afar. Yeah, I, I and I'm in the same boat. Like I said, the, the, the Doctor No one uh, and the Casino Royale one are the only two that I need. I really wish I could have gotten the On Her Majesty Secret Service one because that one also has the the date wheel uh, that on the seventh day uh, it's 007. Yeah, that is kind and, of which, which is pretty dope. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's the fantastic special edition line. Um, apparently, they did one like 20 years ago for the 40th anniversary of the film franchise. I had no clue about this. Like, like, you know, in, in my, in my travels and in my knowledge gathering had no clue that Swatch came out with like 20 different James Bond watches to commemorate each of the films up to that point um, that you can still find out there. They're not quite as nice though. Like, like the designs are a little whack on those. So. Now, do you remember what were these limited to? Uh, they did not say. They just, so, so the way that I made sure to get mine is I actually pre-ordered mine before the release from the 007 store in the UK. So I like paid international shipping and the whole, the whole nine yards. And I still missed out on one of them just because yeah. they didn't get enough stock uh, to cover all of the pre-orders. Interesting. Yeah. My wife got lucky. She just hopped onto the Swatch website uh, the day that they released and managed to get one of the Casino Royale ones. And she had hers before I had mine. So go figure. 
mind you, I never knew a 007 store existed. It does, absolutely, where you can get all the knickknacks and things that 007 uh, wears in his uh, in his movies. At a very nice premium, I Oh, guess. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Absolutely. Um, no, no, it's definitely, it's nice to see an affordable limited edition. Um, I know you're a huge Bond fan, so I know for you this was a, a big thing for you, so I'm glad you got the watch. Um, that's a that's a nice addition. Uh, me, on the other hand, I'm wearing a loner. Um, a loner that I, I have to say, man, listen, this thing has changed my mind completely on, on like vintage chronographs, um, the appeal of them, and uh, also not having a date on a chronograph because the thing is just, it looks so damn good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am wearing the Bulova surfboard. I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, there's a little a lot of light. There's, well, if, if they go to your Instagram, they can see a couple of really good. Oh, things. definitely, definitely. Um, so I have it in on loan. Um, came, it's been released for a little while. It's, if I remember correctly, they have three different quartz versions, and then they're also they also have a a auto version which comes in at 38 millimeters um all look good uh it really has that nice vintage 1970s boulevard kind of look um nicknamed the surfboard because the two sub dials are kind of part of one um cut out that reminds you of a surfboard um it's a quartz chronograph and usually i'm eh, when it comes to quartz chronographs but um especially when they have like a ticking second hand. But um, I don't know. I like this. Um, simple, I like the overall look. If it's got a similar movement to what's in the Lunar Pilot, then the Bull of a Quartz chronographs are pretty good. Do you, do you get the smooth sweep on the chronograph hand? Yes. Okay. So oh, yeah, then you're, then you're probably getting um, the same movement that's in the Lunar Pilot. Yeah. One thing, I, one, at least. one thing I do like about the, the this uh, is – one cool feature about the quartz chronographs is they set up that system where if the if the chronograph hand is a little off, mm-hmm. you have a way of fixing it mm-hmm. um, using which is it's a nice feature to have. I mean, I've yet to really see an automatic which has a chronograph hand. I, I don't know how they could really. You know what I mean? But um, I I figure if it were to ever happen, the, your only real option would be to bring it in for someone to kind of realign it. Um, it's nice because when I first got this one in, it was off. And I was just like, oh, crap. And then I reminded myself, oh, no, you just pull out the crown um, and then you just start working the top of chronograph pressure and it starts slowly ticking. You can hold it down so it goes faster and right before you get to 12, slow it down and you just line it back up. And it's been great ever since. But it's a nice... Nice piece. Like uh, Brad said, check the Watch With Us channel Instagram. You'll see a ton of pictures. Um, and I'm just rocking it for a little while. Because um, I'm kind of like in a... I wouldn't say a slump, but I'm kind of in like a... I'm not really in the mood to buy any watches kind of mode. Well, I, I don't... Uh, before Because this that transitions nicely into the first topic we talked about. Before we talk about that, though, um, I, I want to, I want to praise this watch. Um, I, I love vintage styled chronographs, like, especially from this, uh, era specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this is a pretty dope watch. I, I checked out the automatic version. Um, <laughs> the price is a little, uh, <laughs> the price is a little, uh, disproportionate, let's say. Um, to, uh, limited, to limited to 300 pieces. Um, uh, that's a that's a good thing. It, it comes out in late March. Price is definitely up there, um, but it, I mean we'll see we'll see. Uh, but I, I mean the quartz pieces are around what you would see, like straight from a brand quartz prices. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I mean there's definitely plenty of opportunities, um, you know, to to find a watch. Maybe you'll be able to get it on sale. But overall, just the look of the thing, I really like the look of the thing um well i i like it it's and it's it's nicely sized um i i kind of dig the fact that it comes like you you don't have it here on the 
on the tropic strap but i kind of like the fact that that's the default strap that mm-hmm. that's included with it and um, it's butterfly clasp uh mm-hmm. nicely signed um clasp it's it's i have to say they definitely thought about a lot of things um and the box sapphire is just oh man it's it's beautiful it's beautiful double dome box sapphire oh, oh beautiful just beautiful i'm in a um i'm in a real like want to get a chronograph state of mind right now there's a, there's a couple there's a couple that i'm looking at um that are all kind of in the same very affordable price range yeah i i i, I had the hots for the laurier for for a good while i i think i might i think i, I still might have like hey they're good looking <laughs> like right. with the laurier the gemini but um that sucker sold out so quickly before I had a chance a chance to make a decision. The watch was gone, and they they don't know when they'll they they say they they'll be getting another shipment. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the way things are, that could be soon. That could be much down the line. Um, but I mean, that thing looks sexy in in every picture I see it in. So I have the hops for that. But um. I'm I'm waffling right now between the Yema Rally Graph or the Nazumi uh, Voitor. I, yeah. I'm I'm kind of like, you you know which one hand does the other. You know which Yema I'm I'm really kind of fiending for. Um, I, not the Rally Graph. Um, there's one they they made specifically for. Um, it's a quartz. They made it for for zero G flights. Mm-hmm. Um, what was that? I think called? it's the spacecraft, right? Is yes, that the, yes, yes. Um, what, yeah, it's the yeah the zero the zero G the spacecraft. I don't know. There's just something about that watch that I find so freaking cool. Like, I like. Um, there, there's definitely aspects of it that I do like. Um, the small seconds is interesting. Especially when you consider that there's no, or is that small seconds, or is that the, uh, is that no, the totalizer? I think that's just the minute totalizer. Oh well, then that's a very interesting, uh, that's a very interesting layout then. In that, yeah, the, it looks like small seconds because that's usually where you would find that mm-hmm. on a watch. So, I mean, I tend to like when the the there's no running seconds on on um. On a quartz, oh, on a quartz chronograph. Right. So I see that, and there's just something so cool about it, and the fact that it has. So the way it's set up is on the inside. Um, but what is that call? I, I f- forget sometimes. Um, is it is it the rehot? Uh, the, the chapter ring is probably. Yes, thank you, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Um, the, on the chapter ring, it has it set up because. The way that they do the the way they do the flights, it's kind of it's set up so that it takes about ten seconds for them to go from I think the one G to two G, then a certain amount of time to get there, and then they come back down. So it's just it's like a cool setup, and overall it's just it's just a cool looking watch. Mm. Um, and like I keep on going back to it, um, all time and time again. Um, so I, I can't, I can't, <laughs> I keep on looking at it because I just find the watch to be amazing. And in total, it takes them 22 seconds to get to that. So it basically takes them 22 seconds to get to that point where they're high enough, where they're going up. And then they have, they basically have a time frame between 22 and 40, 44 seconds after they've started their climb and their descent where they get the zero G and they have those kind of marked on the chronograph. Mm-hmm. So like people who are specifically doing this, it's kind of cool for them to be able to time it. But even for like a, a guy like me, I just find it so, I find it like so interesting and like, it's definitely something that I think maybe down the line I'll look at again. But other than that, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, I find it's cool. Yeah, Yema, Yema in general um, is a brand that I've kind of slept on a little bit, but a couple friends of mine have gotten them recently, and they're a bit more impressive than I uh, than I anticipated that they might be. Mm. Yeah, but as you said, that leads to our 
our first topic, um, which has definitely been on my mind. Um, and we started talking about it a little while ago. Uh, the, the, the fear of, <laughs> of regretting purchase. <laughs> or, or FORP. As FORP. Well. Um, <laughs> as, as everybody's, as everybody's heard of FOMO, fear of missing out. But I've definitely reached a, a point now where I'm definitely, I'm FORP. I'm fear, I have a heavy fear of regretting anything that I purchase. And I, I'll kind of explain that a little bit better to you guys. So there's always a sense that I'm going to pick up a watch that I really like initially. And within a, a smaller time frame, I'm just going to be like, okay, I don't really like the watch anymore. <laughs> and it, it drives me, it drives me nuts because there's, there's it, the process has literally been find a watch, like a watch, Oh, I don't like that. Oh, I don't like that. Oh, I don't like that. I'm not buying it. Um, but I, cause I never want to get to a point where I find a watch, buy a watch, and then I'm getting all that after I have the watch. And then I end up just, I end up just buying a watch that I'm not really, I'm not really in love with. I'm not going to keep it. I'm just like, screw it. I, I get rid of it. Um, but yeah, that's where I was kind of going with for um, the new term. There's but, um, so one of the videos that I'm doing or that I have planned to do is a video talking about watches that are kind of like on my purchasing radar. There's like five watches right now that I would consider, um, consider buying if, you know, when the money becomes available and some of them are longer term purchases like, you know, Grand Seiko and, and some things like that. But there's a lot of other watches on the list and these aren't watches that are like brand, brand new releases. Like some of these watches have been available readily for quite some time. And there have been periods over the past several months that I've had the money available to purchase one or more of them if I wanted to. And I have it. And, and it's because of this feeling that you described where it's like, I go into it and I look at it and I was like, I know I like this watch. I know that I would enjoy this watch, but for how long am I going to exactly. keep this watch forever? Am I? And, and the, the thing is, unfortunately, you don't know until you actually have the watch in hand. Now, fortunately, you and I are in a position um, that many people are not, is that in some cases we have the ability to get these watches before we, <laughs> before we purchase them, if we're like reviewing them or something mm -hmm. like that. Or if we go to like a, you know, like a watch show or, you know, some, something of that nature that we can at least have some hands-on experience with them mm -hmm. before having to make that decision. But even then with that, like it's still, there's just, there's just this mental block and it's, it's, it's cool that you came up with a name for it um, that, that, that we have with the whole four acronym. Yeah. But I feel, I feel that all the time because it's, I'm, I'm kind of at the point in my watch buying collection where I, I, it's not that I mind buying a watch that I know I'm going to flip later. Like, especially for me, just because I can review it and, and get content out of it. Mm -hmm. But I also don't want to be doing that all the time. Like, that's not something that is, is something that I want to be doing on a regular basis. Like, anything that I buy, ideally, I'd like to keep. Yeah. Or at least have the intention on doing it and then, you know, later on down the road, things change or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of where I'm at right now as well, is that there's a lot of watches that I have not... Um, decided to purchase because of because of forp basically yeah forp it, it's you know what it is you you we're lucky enough to where we see a lot of watches and part of that also adds to me not wanting as much mm -hmm. because i get to experience them but the biggest thing is that because i've seen so many watches i've seen so many things done that like I've so narrowed exactly what I want that it's really hard for me to now be kind of distracted by something else. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know what? I, I, I have a picture and I have an idea of what I want in my head and to see anything else, like it just doesn't really get me like it used to. Like there used to be a point in time where like if I saw a watch and I really liked it for like two days, I was just like, I'm getting the watch. 
and part of that was just, I just wanted that nice feeling that first time I opened up the box and I'm just like, oh yes, it's mine. But now, because there were so many times where literally a week or two weeks after that, I just know, I just literally fell out of love with the watch. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very, I don't know, I could jade it down. Like I feel very, uh, like I don't want to have to deal with that anymore. Like it, it it's going to take something very special for me to put out my money right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we, we talked a little while ago right now. There's, I'm actually, uh, there's one watch that I have that's going to be coming down the line, but, you know, between the time it takes to have it made and everything, it's going to be a little while. And that watch is, is definitely going to be added to the group of watches that I'm never going to sell mm-hmm. because just of what it's going to mean to me. And part of it also what I'm going to invest to, into it because it, it's not going to come, come cheaply. Um, but other than that, which I, I, and I had that specific watch and you know what, the, I don't know why I'm beating around the bush. I have, I have plans of, um, uh, I interviewed RT a little while ago and ever since I met RT. Of, actually, of, of Vortic watches, by the way. Of Vortic watches. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm just, yeah. Casual I, RT, so. <laughs> <laughs> ever since I met RT of Vortic, I met RT, what was it, about two, two years ago. Um, spent more time with him at Basel, but really m- met him. Um, a, I, a, it's been a little while since I've met him. Um, met him kind of when I was getting in the thick of the whole watches thing, and, and I, I met him, and I really liked what he was doing. Um, and I had, uh, I had just purchased a pocket watch because um, I wanted to add that to my collection because I wanted to have something that kind of represented, you know, watches of old kind of mm-hmm. like the, the beginning of, of, of that, the, that whole history. Um, and right now, I, I, every time I would meet him, I would say, I have this pocket watch. I really want, you know, I like what you do. I really want to get it converted. And finally, this last time when I met him for the interview, I was actually able to give him a watch and he's going to get started on that process for me. And that's something like I've always wanted to do. And, and that, it's weird. I don't even consider that like, a purchase. Mm-hmm. I consider that like, like something, a goal of mine that I always had. Um, I always wanted to add that to, to the collection. Um, so outside of that, everything else I've seen, mm-hmm. and I've seen a lot of stuff. I've been real timid, real like, you know what? No, I'm not gonna, I don't care how much it is. I don't care that it's affordable. I don't care that it's not really going to hurt that much. I'm just not going to buy it because mm-hmm. I know I'm not keeping it. I could tell myself that a million times. Yeah, Ricardo. Yeah. You're going to enjoy it. Yeah, you're going to keep it. It's gonna... No, I know I'm not. <laughs> so why am I lying to myself? I'm going to well, buy it's, it. It's funny because I'm kind of in the same, I'm in a weird, like a similar position because while, so I was kind of actively saving for the Grand Seiko mm-hmm. for a while. And then because I knew that it was going to take longer because, you know, instead of, you know, taking some of the tax-free fund that we got back and putting that towards it, like we wanted to get our floors redone in our living room. So that's what we did this year. Mm-hmm. So I didn't put anything towards it. I'm like, ah, I don't really, you know, I'm not going to not buy a watch for, you know, the next two years while I save up for this thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm not you know, not actively saving up for it. Like it's kind of on the back burner now, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, that's like the watch that would get me excited Mm -hmm. to purchase. And so all these other watches that I'm interested in, the impetus isn't there. And it's not because I'm actively trying to save for the Grand Sago, but it's because honestly, that's what I want. (laughs) You know what I mean? And while these other watches are cool, I don't think that any of them are going to give me the same satisfaction uh, that I would get from when I eventually do purchase yeah. the watch that I'm looking at down the road. Yeah. For me, that watch would be that Polar Oyster Perpetual. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's the watch where that's the only watch right now. <laughs> and it's funny because I never thought there would come a day where the one watch I'm really thinking about is a Rolex. Mm-hmm. I never, I never thought that 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 day would come, but 
the watch constantly comes back into my mind as being that overall, like everyday great watch that that and you know I still have that thought of the 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 go anywhere do anything watch. And that watch always comes back to my mind. Ever since I was introduced to that watch, it always comes back to my mind. And it's not like everything else pales in comparison to it. Like there are watches that are better, that that'll be that are not as expensive. There are watches that are more, that are even better. Like there are a ton of different other watches, but that tends to be the one watch that in the middle of night when I wake up and I'm thinking about watches, that's the watch that's that comes to my mind. So it's weird. Everything else is kind of just like, it's not really doing anything for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's not eliciting that, that feeling that you're supposed to kind of get when you really, really want to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it does, but it's not long lasting. Like it's literally, it's there and it's fleeting. It's gone. So I, it's been interesting. I've spent, I'm trying to think, I don't think I've I've bought a watch this whole year. Mm -hmm. Since the year started, I haven't bought one watch. Well, to be fair, you loaded up at the end of last year. So so I said you loaded up at the end of last year. So that's a carry for a little (laughs) while. But But, um, I mean, other than that, and mind you, one of those is gone. mm -hmm. Um, I, I keep, I have one of those and pretty much. Yeah. I think my, Right now, my collection is down to my tutor, mm-hmm. um, the Citizen, mm-hmm. um, the Honeymooner, mm-hmm. and the Cassioke that you have. The Cassioke. Yep. Um, well, I no longer have it. That's now my wife's watch. Plenty. Okay. <laughs> still, it's still in the household, though. So. Ah, when she wants to bring it back. Sometimes I swear she keeps it at work just to make sure I'm <laughs> see it again. That's hers. I officially have said that's hers. Um, so if you take that out, and then I have my um, my Metal G, which I need to get fixed because one of the batteries in there just died. Mm-hmm. So I need to get that fixed. So really, I, I'm really running around. Oh, and one more thing, the, the Timex Q, which I changed the bracelet, which now makes it a little bit more more comfortable. It, it doesn't bite the, um, the wrist hairs as, mm-hmm. as much as it used to. Um, but I'm looking at that, and I'm just like, I'm not really in a rush for everything, anything else. Like there's a ton of watches I see and I'm just, Ooh, that looks nice, but not enough for me to take the card out and be like, bang. Let me right. do it. So that's fork for you. You know, you, you definitely, you fear regretting that purchase because that feeling is so. Ugh. Well, but, but like you said, it's, it's fighting the, the other feeling of the new watch. And I, and I think that that's, it's a tough feeling to fight because even, even those of us that have been doing this a while, like there's something about that feeling of getting that new watch and opening the box and doing all. And, and it feels oh. great. But like you said, we, we've, we've, we've kind of refined ourselves to learn on which watches that that feeling is going to be kind of more fleeting. Mm-hmm. And so we're kind of getting better at being, being smarter with our, our money. So, yeah. Which is tough. Um, it's very tough. I, I have to say, though, this, this current situation we're in is making it much easier because I'm seeing less <laughs> and less watches. <laughs> yeah, we got it. We, well, we, we'd be, so we'd be remiss if um, we didn't address the, you know, the coronavirus is, is taking in the not, room. not just the watch industry, but every industry. Oh, my God. My storm. Um, so what used to be SIHH or what is it? Watches and Wonders is what they call it now. Mm-hmm. Canceled. Yeah. Um, Fossil World. Can't, postponed. Well, postponed. Post, postponed. Right. And I, I'm telling you, it's postponed because that language is probably keep making sure that they keep whatever deposits were made. Because, yes. of that thing. <laughs> because there's no, every, I'm telling you, the, when I read that press release, the first thing that came to my mind when I saw the word postponed was, that's that's strictly a legal legalies. That's why they're saying postponed. Because if they say postponed, now it's not canceled. And now vendors still have an opportunity to present at a show. Mm-hmm. Even though it's postponed till next year, they could blame it on a force majeure. You know, coronavirus is out of a control, but they still keep whatever deposits were made or whatever money 
was 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 already put down. Um, so it, I read that and I was just like, yeah, come on, dude. Yeah. Like, you, really, you, ain't, you ain't wrong. Like, it's canceled, but you're going to say postpone? Aye, aye, whatever. It's, it's cool. It's cool. Um, so, but that's but that's kind of that's kind of like the the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, where we're gonna see it affecting the watch industry, and and we know this anecdotally, just from people that we talk to, like friends that we have that you know, especially like micro brand owners, things of that nature. But I can't imagine that larger brands are also going to avoid this. Um, is when it comes to production, so because the Chinese market or the Chinese manufacturing market is so just ingrained into the watch industry that the, the fact that the country was basically like locked down for several weeks um, is going to creep into the supply line. So for those of you that are not, not aware um, every year in February, basically the entire country of China shuts down for like three weeks for the Chinese New Year. They they love they take their Chinese New Year very seriously. So basically like, you know, the, the everything in the country shuts down. However, this is something that companies are aware of, it's planned for, it's known, it's on the calendar. You make adjustments for that. You know, there's no there's no unforeseen delays because of Chinese New Year unless you're an idiot and don't realize <laughs> you know what what, what you're doing. It occurs, yeah. Um but the the outbreak of the coronavirus um, has complicated that because where people would normally be coming back for Chinese New Year, um, now co- factories are still slow to get off the ground as the country works to kind of keep the, the virus co- from becoming like a full-blown pandemic <laughs> over there. Um, and, and it's delayed things by several weeks. Now, factories are starting to come back. And this isn't just the watch industry. This is any industry that relies on Chinese manufacturing, the place that I work. Um, Which is mostly a ton of industries. Yes. But like, like the place that I work rely, like relies on Chinese manufacturing. They've already told us, hey, we haven't experienced it yet, but there's going to come a time where you know, stock levels are hinky because we're, we're, we're behind schedule in, in terms of getting stuff over here. Mm-hmm. Um, you're gonna, you've already seen it with some... Um, micro brand watches, especially those that are crowdfunded, uh, that had like delivery targets that are going to have to get moved back because, you know, delays happen. And this is a pretty big one. Um, but it's uh, w- the thing that I'm going to find interesting is to see what, if any, impact this has on the market in terms of like pricing and stuff like that, because as the supply chain momentarily, at least kind of drops off Mm -hmm. and you'd have to imagine it will, at least in some cases, what's that going to do pricing wise? Do you think as we go? I mean, I, I, I see there's there's so many ways this, this can go. Um, And, and, and if you're just talking about the watch industry, it's it's affected in well, I, this is kind of where we have to start. The different areas it's affected. Production, regardless of what anybody tells you, a lot of Swiss-made watches, their parts are produced in China. It doesn't have to be the main parts like your 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 movements and and, and things like that, but certain things like dials, hands, cases. Um, glass. bracelets, um, glass, a lot of that is produced in China simply because they, they have the infrastructure in there already. So a lot of brands depend on it. Um, we won't, we won't get into the specific brands, but let's just say a lot is produced. Put it, put it this way. The, the only brands that could probably make the case that they don't have any reliance on China is like the Hote Horology brands that mm-hmm. most people listening to see this podcast probably aren't buying anyway. Yep. So. Yep. so except for those brands, we're willing to bet a good portion of everybody, everybody that's left has some form of production in China. So that's one thing. Um, chi- the Chinese themselves as buyers represent a large portion of the market uh, that buys 
watches and Swiss watches specifically. So that, that's another uh, part of this that you have to understand. The effect of now all these trade shows being canceled, not because the brands are not showing up, but mostly because the, the buyers are not showing up because they represent such a large portion of buyers. All these different things, when you take them together, you throw them in a pot and you mix them up. I see it as, and I hate to say it's almost like an opportunity Mm -hmm. for brands to get rid of older stock. Hmm. It's, It's a great opportunity where now if you have watches that weren't really moving, um, you know, you, you, you had really controlled um, the supply chain on them. You know, as a, weren't really moving. Uh, people know about maybe they weren't getting as much play as they're supposed to, as, as they, they weren't advertised as much. This is a great opportunity to go back, look at what you currently have in stock. And I'm not saying you have basically a flash sale. But I'm saying this is a great opportunity for you. You already have new stuff coming down the line. And it's, if it's paused, there's nothing you can do about it. You know what? It's paused. But this is a great opportunity for, now, for you to now be like, okay, hey, we have this. Um, and, well, you know what? It, we'll be giving it a – not giving away. We'll, we'll be pricing it a little bit cheaper this time. Maybe 10%, 20% off. Nothing, nothing drastic, but something – Something that'll, you know, you know, whet the appetite, make people like, oh, okay, that's cool. <clears throat> Cause I think this will, this will be a nice opportunity. Cause I always heard the problem with brands having too much stock that's just not moving. And of course, a lot of that stock ending up on the gray market. Take this as an opportunity to take back control of that, put some more watches out there yourself. And you'll kind of get rid of that old stock because from what I've heard, a lot of people still see there's a light at the end of the tunnel when it's going to come right now. We just don't know, but a lot of people are still expecting a light to be at the end of the tunnel. When that light comes, you could just get back into your normal production, get those new watches out there. That'd be cool. But take this, don't take this opportunity to just be, this is the worst time for you to just stand still Mm -hmm. and wait, be proactive. (laughs) <laughs> get your product out there, advertise your product, which you know what, because all of these shows are, 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 are can't are canceled slash postponed. You know what? This might also be a great opportunity for you guys to kind of work on what you always should have been working, mm-hmm. which is social, um, so, social marketing, um, you know, finding out which is the best way to advertise your products. Don't just rest right now. This is, this is a great opportunity because <laughs> it's not like all this product is sitting in China. Mm. It's out there. It's all over the world. You know, Switzerland, the U.S. Stock is there. Stock is, 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 is there. Take this opportunity to push what you currently have and, and just push it through social media, um, you know, targeted advertising, do something. Don't just stand still. Mm. And, and that's what I'm kind of afraid some brands are going to do. Some brands are just going to be like, uh, because I feel like some brands feel like I constantly have to produce something new to keep the attention of people, which in many ways you have to, but in this instance, you're kind of stuck. You have no choice. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you, the worst thing you could do now is start talking about something new that you know you're not going to get out, be able to get out to people until maybe next year with all right these. from or at least or at least much later than you expected to the expected so you know what take this opportunity to reintroduce the public to your brand work on your image work on your product work on you know what audiences really like your stuff because honestly it's not like people are just gonna walk out now and be like oh yeah that's the perfect time to to get a rolex some of us will, <clears throat> but for the most part, we're not all, we're not Rolex people. Mm-hmm. We're looking at different brands, you know, take this opportunity. Um, that's, if I was a brand, that's what I would be thinking. I would be like, you know what? We have our contracts in place right now. It's at a standstill. 
let's refocus our energy on trying to get our old stock. And when I say old stock, I'm not talking about like 10, five years ago. I'm like stuff that you put out last year, stuff that Mm -hmm. you put out in 2018 that just wasn't moving as much as you'd like. But because you got in the cycle of, of your advertising, you haven't really had a time to advertise it because you're, you were about to advertise your 2020 stuff. Right. You know what? Take this as an opportunity to really punch down people's necks. Hey, this is our 2019 stuff. We introduced you to it. This is what we do. Huh. I don't know. That's, that's just kind of how I see it. So I want to, I want to quickly revisit um, the trade show aspect. So I've, I've talked before how Basel in the watch industry and E3 in the gaming industry have a lot of interesting parallels as far as what they are, but also the, the, the strife that both are going through at the same time. And there's a lot of speculation out there right now that if E3 gets canceled because of the whole coronavirus issue, they're already kind of on shaky ground. So like for those of you that aren't aware, um, Nintendo has not been exhibiting at E3 for the past couple of years, or at least not doing a presentation there. Uh, Sony was not there last year. Everyone assumed that was because, ah, they don't really have anything. We're, we're still the year before new consoles are coming out. They'll be back in 2020 when the PlayStation 5 is coming out. Well, PlayStation 5 is coming out. Guess who's still not going to be at E3? Sony. So you've lost two of your two biz- biggest exhibitors. And people were now starting to question, is E3 necessary? Is it still viable for the gaming industry? All of a sudden, if you have this cancellation that has to happen because of, because of the coronavirus, all these exhibitors that were paying just like Basel millions of dollars to go to rent booth space, to set everything up, to hire people, to run events and this side or the other. And you're forced to kind of do ad hoc marketing. You're forced to kind of get your stuff out there yourself, you know, through YouTube or to fly out reviewers to special events that you're doing. And all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, do we need E3 anymore? Because we're able to kind of just do all this stuff on our own. And I'd be kind of worried now because we're already seeing the same thing with Basel. All of these big brands leaving, Swatch Group, see you later, Breitling, we're not going to be there anymore. You know, all these, all these big brands, 10 pole brands uh, pulling out of the show. And now they're forced to stay home this year. I agree with you that brands, I think, are going to get kind of go back to the drawing board, figure out ways that they can market direct to consumers and direct to dealers. Uh, that, you know, where, where they used to rely on Boston World now, we're going to have to come up with some other ways. Maybe we'll do these singular events, but it's going to cost a fraction of the price that it costs to rent a booth at Basel World. What if this obsoletes Basel World in general to the watch industry? It's, people have been talking about that, but if you, if you think about the main reason behind Basel, which was, Instead of people going to multiple different things, you would get them all in one place and it would just be make things easier. Mm -hmm. I think you're always going to kind of need something like that. Um, Just a central, a central place. Mm -hmm. But you, but do you, but do you need, do you need Basel world though? Like, like what's to stop, a bunch of brands, maybe like smaller brands, maybe not, maybe not like your Rolexes and, and things. Like I mean, that, but smaller brands to just form up, you know, like Volcom themselves a smaller show. They're they're doing it right now. Yeah. Um, the whole Watch Days thing that <laughs> just that just came out the other day, where you have a couple brands. Um, you listen to Arden, um, I think I'm trying to remember some of the other brands. You have a couple brands coming together. Mm-hmm. They're not coming in one place. They're basically going to be in Geneva and like one brand will have this hotel, this hotel, um, that convention center, and they'll just be showing off their stuff that way. So it's, 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 it can happen, but it, it's, it's so funny because the main reason, one of the main reasons the show was created was to keep that from happening mm-hmm. because people were not, people didn't like having to do that. You know, 80s didn't like having to, to visit each one of their products that they sell in different places. It just got to a point where they're like, no, why can't we just have it in one place? Mm-hmm. <laughs> where I think Basel kind of messed up is I think they kind of got greedy. Mm-hmm. 
the group behind Basel. I mean, the last few years they spent, I think it was billions of dollars on the new hall. Just because they're like, ah, we can't. And, and this is a great opportunity because, I mean, that was during the high time of watches. Just, just everything was just selling and then people just making tons of money. But we're kind of past that time. And I think had they not gotten so greedy and not have so much invested into this show, it would still be what it used to be, but it, it's just not that anymore. What I, what I kind of see happening is, okay, I could see, side note, Basel has been postponed to January of next year, which still makes me wonder. So, what are they going to do about Basel? In right, yeah, <laughs> this is all, like, like, I, I have to imagine that gets that gets that that gets that pushed. If that either that gets scratched or that gets pushed back, so it, that's that's one thing. But what I could definitely see is, let's say Basel World <laughs> kaputs. Few years later, I could definitely see it getting to a point where some other reiteration of Basel world comes back. Geneva land. Yeah. Some, yeah, <laughs> some, some iteration reiteration of it appears again, because I think need is a strong word, but I think there's, there are benefits to a show like Basel, but I do feel like they got to a point where they just got a little greedy. Yeah. The brands were just like, screw this. No. You're not gonna. You're not gonna just you know, smack us upside the head with some of these costs. It's just too much. <clears throat> but it's gonna be interesting to see. One, how brands approach this now, mm-hmm. uh, because I think some brands are 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 have enough youth in them to kind of approach this and still be okay. But if like, they're smart, that 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 is it's smart. So what I what I find interesting is I I'm going to find it interesting to see which brands those are. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> there's probably quite a few brands uh, that are going to get caught flat-footed here, and might be bigger brands than you think that just have yeah. a very old, old school mentality that have not really been tested. Yeah, it's it's weird. I think there 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 are some brands who people will buy their stuff regardless mm-hmm. or they have a specific audience that they sell to where for them, they don't they, get gaining, gaining more customers would be great, but they're doing just fine with where they are. It's going to be interesting to see what happens to those brands um, because I think they might be negatively affected by this. Mm-hmm. Because what I think might happen is other brands will take this opportunity to really push what they have. And brands like the first group that I was talking about might end up losing customers from because of that. So it's going to be interesting. Like, like it, part of my mind is going to be like, oh, are we going to see, get back to the days where you used to see a lot of watch advertising mm-hmm. um, on TV? Um, you know, and not just the big brands. Like it's gonna be interesting to see if 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 you know it's like nine o'clock, ten o'clock, somebody gets like that 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 midnight spot, and all of a sudden it's not just Invicta you're seeing. But what's <laughs> what's funny people. though? What's funny though is I think that would be that would be the wrong way to go. Much much like much like political campaigns, like like the like the older school political campaigns do a lot of TV advertising mm-hmm. when you probably shouldn't. Digital's the way to go, man. You yeah. want you want your watches to get out there? Go on YouTube. That's where you want to advertise. But here's the interesting thing. This generation and their and how they respond to advertising is so weird. Like it it's direct advertising doesn't seem to work on them because they always walk into it with the mindset that this person is trying to sell me something. Mm-hmm. And oh my gosh, that's such a terrible thing. It, it's weird. It's more like indirect advertising works on them. Oh, this person says it's cool, so it must be cool, so I'm gonna get it. Or this thing, this person says that, you know, this is part of a lifestyle, so that must be cool, so I'm going to get it. It, it, it I, There's always, I always feel this sense where the direct advertising, where someone in front of you from the brand is saying, here's what I have, buy it. It, 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 it doesn't really work that well on this generation. The people, they're going to have to be... 
they're going to have to find a better way. They're just going to have to find a better way. They, I mean, some amount of money has must have already been spent on on how to attract the newer demographic of of, of potential watch buyers out there. Mm-hmm. Like, there, there's got to be, I won't say some type of magic formula, but there's got to be something that these guys have thought of or maybe have invested in that would kind of work. Like, I'll be completely honest. If a brand went and just started a YouTube channel, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, that, but I don't think that necessarily works. It, I, think it, I think be, it can if you produce good content. Like, that, like that's, that's all. That's what it is. Yeah, like, like you said, it's, it's not that direct advertising can't work. Is that traditional advertising can't work you have you have to you have to design your campaigns to be a little bit more unique and a little bit more modern but here's the question what do you if a brand open did a youtube channel right now mm-hmm. what would you consider good content from that brand that's a good question like think about it. them talking about their history them talking about how great their watches are like they're not going to talk about other watches. Hmm. <laughs> so, so what would you consider good content from that? Think about it. Like everybody says, oh, if you just go on YouTube. But one of the main things content, reason content works so well on YouTube is because a lot of the people who are producing the content, they're not tied into one specific thing. Hmm. One of my favorite pieces of content is, I, f- I forgot, I think it's Kai, the guy who does the, 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 the phot- um, photography. Hmm. He's um, he, 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 he's always um, reviewing a new lens and he does street photography. I'm not sure if Kai's a word, but I, I, I've watched a ton of his videos. It's terrible that I don't know exactly what his full name is, but, <laughs> but I've watched so many of them. One of the main draws of that is the fact that he doesn't focus on just one thing. Mm-hmm. He doesn't focus on just one brand. It, 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 that's what attracts so many people to his channel. If a brand opens a YouTube channel, how are you really attracting? What content could you produce? Most of most of the people who produce really good content on YouTube have multiple things that they're they're approaching. How can a brand do that? Think about it. if the only thing a brand sells is watches, and the only thing that they're going to talk about are their watches. What would you consider good content from a watch brand? Like it's, it's it can be done because it already exists out there in some form or fashion. I think the the way that you do it is you hire a dedicated like social media team, and like you said, oh, they can talk about their history. They can talk about their history. Like it doesn't all have to be about modern content, but if you present it in a way that's engaging, if you present it in a way that is insightful. That's like the companies that I care about the most are the ones that I feel invested because they've done a good job at kind of, I don't even want to say making me like, you know, part of the, the part of the zeitgeist with the company, but that's kind of what they do. Like, and, and we've talked about it with some micro brand companies as well. Obviously that's kind of a different thing because they're working on a much smaller scale, but like Monta is a company that does a great job at making their customers feel inclusive into what mm-hmm. they're doing. Um, Notice is a company that does a great job of making their customers feel inclusive as into what they're doing. It can be done. It requires a little bit of outside of the box thinking. Mm-hmm. And it also requires you to kind of overcome a hurdle of initial skepticism, because like you said, especially this generation is going to be a little bit cynical when they're being marketed to. However, you also have a bigger potential audience because you're already going to have a level of reach that other companies won't have because especially if you're a big name, like a Rolex or something like that, you're, you're starting from a better position. Yeah. But, but the one thing it also requires you to do is to be a little bit more open about what. Well, and that, and that's why it's not going to be Rolex, but there are other companies that can, that can certainly um, hop in on that. Though I think. It's, it's interesting. When you mentioned the micro brand, I was thinking about good content. I was, I thought about, um, ECA for a second, mm-hmm. you know, just, just, I mean, they the just this, this journey into them with the whole in-house movement. Which, Actually, which, let, let me stop you real quick. You know, who's done a really good job at creating social media content, but they haven't been the ones doing it themselves, but they're making smart partnerships is Seiko. Seiko's done a fantastic job, especially with the Grand Seiko line, because they've done partnership videos with Warren and Wound 
and Hodinkee where they're leveraging the production values that those guys give, but they're specifically doing videos talking about here's the history of the Grand Seiko 9F course movement. Here's the history of spring drive. Those videos are really interesting. Those videos helped me get more invested in Grand Seiko. Which might be, which might be the best, if not only way for you really to approach it. Right. Like if it, if it's, if I'm selling, if I'm selling my watch to you and I walk up to you and I talk about it, that's one thing. But if the guy I sold it to who loves it and has a passion for it comes up to you and says the exact same thing, mm -hmm. you take him more, I'm not going to say more seriously, but you take what he says with a more, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. You, you take it a little bit with, with more, more credibility. It, but, it's, just, but it's not even that. Like they, they literally had Warren and Wound come out to like the Grand Seiko factory and interview some of their people just talking about the history of the movements and putting together a really well done video. That's it's only like 15 minutes long, but just all about spring drive. So if you ever wanted to learn about spring drive, or if you ever wanted to know why it's special, here's this video that you can check out. But then that leads to another thing. How many brands actually have that to talk about? There are a lot, but like you said, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head perfectly is you have to be willing to kind of open the doors a little bit. You can't yeah. be the secretive, you know, like, oh, we, we can't talk about any of this stuff because we yeah. don't want our competitors to even have an inch, inch. into what yeah. we're doing in our business. So. Yeah. So it, it's, you know what, because I, I feel like this generation, it's things like that that they gravitate to. They want story. They want, they, they want history. They want a, they want to peer behind the veil. They, they, they want something more than just here. Here's a watch I think you should buy. They want something more attached to it. They want to experience from it. Mm -hmm. so, so it's going to be interesting to see how people approach it. But I think the way you describe it might be the best way. The way Seiko has kind of done what they've done. And, it, and kind of approach content makers to 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 kind of be there that first mm -hmm. that first time that people really hear about the brand and, I mean, and I, look, to be to be frank like i've only been kind of attuned to this industry for two plus years now at this point but in that two plus years grand seiko's like people's awareness of grand seiko as a brand and desirability has skyrocketed yep it is not a coincidence that that happens to coincide with some of the things that they're doing to kind of get their name out there. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, um, that was great discussion. Pal. Yeah. Like I said, I like it. I, I, I always enjoy kind of when we put broad topics on because we end up tangenting into yeah. something it's else. So. Definitely. definitely. <laughs> Which is good. Yeah. But yeah. So like I said, we made it. Uh, hopefully we will, both stay quarantined and not have to get any, any other illnesses uh, that will keep us from missing our, our regularly scheduled uh, yeah. program here. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping by the next time we record this, we're on the other side of this. Well, don't, I'm, I'm I wouldn't hoping. hold my breath. I know. I know. I know. It's, it's going to get worse before it gets better, especially where we're residing right now. So is it weird that, that the more and more people talk about this, I can't keep on getting like images of um, outbreak from my head i mean look man i mean it's 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 the, the it, and when i say images i mean the the biggest thing about outbreak was there was always this sense of well for outbreak the key was finding what caused it so that a cure could be made hmm. but there was always a sense of that you were constantly behind it right well and 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 talking to chris vale from nth in like a private chat that we have he mentioned the fact that like, look, there's been like viral outbreaks before over the past couple of years, but this feels different, which means that it is different because the response is different. So somebody knows something that's, you know, yeah. that, that's that makes this somehow worse or, yeah. or somehow more dangerous than, dangerous than stuff we've dealt with in the past. So, yeah. So like I said, I don't, I, I, I have no bones that we're going to be like, we're still going to be, you know, neck deep uh, in the middle of this the next time you and I convene, I'm sure. Um, yeah. And we'll see if it affects the watch industry uh, any more over the next couple of weeks uh, to see if we have anything new to talk about in terms of the. I mean, back, so. yeah. we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Um, but guys, uh, thanks for listening and watching. Yep. 
Um, once again, Brad, hit him up with all of our sources. You should, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, if you've not subscribed uh, to the Watch With Us channel, hit the red subscribe button down below and ring the bell icon. Uh, if you've not yet subscribed to my channel, uh, go in the description, click over to the budding watch enthusiast, hit subscribe there as well. Hopefully we can get back on track now that I can actually speak and, uh, and, and make some video content so we can get some new stuff coming out to you soon. Um, if you're listening on audio, uh, make sure you subscribe to the watch with us podcast feed, wherever you get your podcasts, uh, no matter what app you do. And then when you're done, head on over to Instagram and we need you to subscribe to watch with us channel. We need you to subscribe to ready, set, watch. We need you to subscribe to budding watch enthusiast. And most importantly, we need you to subscribe to bearded time because that's what you're here listening to after all. Indeed. indeed. I think I got them all. There you go. Once again, guys, thank you. We'll see you soon. Take it easy.